Well, hello, my YouTube fellows and gals. So, if you're new to my channel, my name's Tammy. I am a used bookstore. I'm under Tammy's Makeup Treats at gmail.com or at Mendes Bookstore and more on Facebook. If you want to order some really nice books, reasonable prices, you can order them through me and I do ship medium out. If you do not order but you like to read with a tech gadget, I am also a resource center for you to come and find out what good books are out there so that you can look them up yourself and go find some really good reading. I love books. I love books. So with that, this week we are working on Lot 15, which I do read the synopsises, which is what the book is about. I read 10 of them per video, and we are on hardbacks. So there we go. In the romance section. So we have Amber Beach by Elizabeth Lowell. This is what the book looks like. It is a 1997 copyright. These are all going to be $3 each. And some of them might have like little spots like little writing i think it looked like a piece of tape or something like that but you got to remember it's a used bookstore not new so with that this is what this book is about honor donovan is a shrewd businesswoman yet she has been shut out of donovan donovan international by her father and four brothers when her favorite brother kyle vanishes along with the fortune and stolen amber honor's questions were ignored by the donovan males Defying them, she heads to the San Juan Islands of the Pacific Northwest in search of answers. Honor needs a guide because she knows nothing about running a boat, and she knows nothing about Jake Mallory until he answers her ad. One of the things she doesn't know is that Jake is much more than a fishing guide. Until Kyle disappeared, Jake was bro brokering Amber Deals in the Baltic, Baltic for Donovan International. Honor is completely unaware of the old war's new politics, greed, and stolen amber that have lured ruthless high-stakes players from around the globe. Jake wants no part of the intrigue or of the Donovan women in his life, but he suspects the Donovans have set him up to take the fall for Kyle's treachery. The way Jake sees it, some Donovan is going to pay for his troubles, and it just may turn out to be Honor. Jake and Honor cast cast off a journey smoldering with this trust betrayal vengeance and temptation a hunger grows between them that is dangerous as the secrets they keep alone at sea they pursue the stubborn mystery of the amber room flee from relentless enemies and fight against trusting each other yet when honor and jake dare to confide in one another they face a final truth the penalty for betrayal is death the reward is a lifetime together and this is just my little cheat sheet. That's my little sticky note for receipts when I sell a book. <laughs> so you, you don't think it's stuck in the book that is. So that is book number one. Book number two, we have Sabrina by Madeline A. Poland. It's got a little writing in the front. That's what the book looks like. This is a 1979 copyright, and this is what the book is about. Sabrina is a rich novel of love and will set in country Cork, Ireland, just before War World War I. It is the story of Sabrina Heron, daughter of a wealthy upper-class family. In her 16th year, Sabrina first faces a con conflict that will shape her future when she meets husband Gerard... Moynihan on her sister's wedding day. For a mom of the strong willed matriarch of the Heron family has no intention of letting romance interfere with her plan of Sabrina. To mom, a duty is the business of life. She rules her household according to a rigid, age old pattern. Until now, all of her children have accepted the roles she chose for them. The oldest son, Ulick, manages Abby Gate, the family estate. Mary Rose, the oldest daughter, married a titled neighbor. Though nearly twice her age, John went into the army. Carefree Terrence, Sabrina's favorite brother, entered the priesthood, and Sabrina was to become a nun. Motivated by her love for Gerard, Sabrina summons the courage to oppose Mama's will for the first time and the strength ultimately to trade duty for defiance. 
with lush Irish settings and details of the pre-war existence of wealthy Irish landowner as the background. This is a strong appealing story of Sabrina and Gerard's love, which prevails the face of past tradition, family duty, and the war's upheaval of life as they knew it. So that is book number two. Book number three. This is, I believe, three books in one. Yes. It's the Battle of the Villa Fiorta, the Green Gage Summer, and the episode of Sparrows by Rumor Gold Gauden. It's a 1963 book. And this is what it's about. The Battle of Villa Fiorta is Frances Clavering had fallen in love with another man. And she was willing to abandon her family to follow him. But Hugh and Caddy, her younger children, were deter determined to save her. And they go to any lengths to break up their mother's adulterous affair and bring her home again. But the children's task was much more complex than it seemed. For as they trailed their mother to the little Italian villa where she was living with her newfound love, they found themselves beginning to like the charming urban man against whom their plot was directed. Book number two in here, The Green Age, the Green Age Summer, no, The Green Gage Summer, the five great children were on their own for several, several weeks, left by their parents at a small country in southern France to spend their summer however they pleased. And before long, they befriended a handsome English gentleman named Elliot, who seemed most interested in 16-year-old Joss, the oldest child, and a rapidly blossomed beauty. Complications arose when Elliot's attentions toward Joss drew the ear of the spiteful woman who managed the inn in the summer came to a boil as the local police became curious about Elliot's true identity. And the third and last book in this series is an episode of Sparrows. Even at the age of 10, Lovejoy Mason was beautiful. Pale skin, flaxen hair, slender to the point of fragility. But Lovejoy had found little love and less joy in the streets of the London slum where she lived until a packet of cornflower seeds changed her world. A vacant lot in the shadow of a bombed out building became her garden. There, with the help of young Tip Malone, who found himself a, a tenderness he hadn't known was there. Lovejoy created an oasis of beauty which would transform not only their, her, her own life but many others as well. That sounds so sweet. So there is book three. Book number four, we have unexpected. Expected Blessings by Barbara T Taylor Bradburn. That's what the book looks like. It's got a little spot right there. It is a 2005 copyright. And this is what the book is about. Okay. Women of substance and ambitious, passionate, and volatile women of the next generation. Evan... Tessa, Lynette, and India. Four remarkable women, three generations of hearts, one indomitable family whose loyalty binds them together and whose enemies want to tear them apart. Evan Hughes, Emma's American great-granddaughter, is trying to integrate into the powerful heart family she has caught between her strange parents, her new family, and her new love, but a dangerous enemy hoovers in the background. Tessa Long, then Evan's cousin, is battling her husband for custody of their daughter, Adelie. When Adelie suddenly goes missing, Tessa is forced to seek help from her half-sister, Lynette, a woman who has been her rival all their lives. Lynette, the most brilliant businesswoman of the four great-granddaughters, is desperately trying to show that she is a natural heir to her mother, Paula, but her glittering future at the helm of the vast heart empire means many sacrifices, perhaps even the loss of her sister's fragile trust. And India Standish, the traditionalist in the family, falls to a famous British artist from a working class background, madly in love. India is determined to marry him no matter what her family thinks. It is Evan who finds new perspective about her own life from the revelations and letters that Emma wrote to Evan, Evan's grandmother decades ago. But they may come too late. As conflict and danger swirl around the heart women, someone is pulling the strings to make sure none of them finds happiness. Who among them will rise to the challenge as only a true heart can do? 
The latest dramatic story is an ongoing saga of an extraordinary family dynasty is full of love, passion, jealousy, and ambition is Barbara Taylor Bradford at her inevitable best. So there you go. Book four. Book number five. We have The Second Time Around by Mary Higgins Clark. That's what the book looks like. It is a 2003 copyright, and this is what the book's about. Nicholas Spencer, charismatic head of a medical research company, Genstone, involved in the development of an anti-cancer vaccine, suddenly disappears. His private plane crashes en route to Puerto Rico, but his body is not found. Early results of a vaccine seem highly promising, yet coinciding with Nicholas Spencer's disappearance comes news that the FDA is denying approval. Then follows the shocking revelation that Spencer had looted Jen Stone of huge sums of money, including lifetime savings of people who risked every penny they had. Marcia Carly DiCarlo, the 32-year-old columnist for Wall Street Weekly, is assigned to cover their story. Carly is the stepsister of Spencer's wife, Lynn, an aggressive PR woman and socialite whom she dislikes and distrusts. The day after news of her husband's disappearance rocks the final financial medical world. Lynn attends a meeting of stockholders of Genstone flaunting expensive clothing and jewelry accused of having participated in a scam. She appears indifferent to the anger and despair of the people attending among them whose child has cancer and who's now about to lose his home. That night, she narrowly escapes death when her mansion in Bedford, New York, is set on fire. She turns to Car Carly, begging her to use her investigative skills to prove that she was not her husband's accomplice. As Carly proceeds with her investigation, she is confronted by seemingly impenetrable questions. Is Nicholas Spencer dead or in hiding? Was he guilty or set up? Why was the sudden reversal in medical opinion of the vaccine from recognition to condemnation? And as the fact begins to unfold, she becomes the target of a dangerous group involved in a sinister and fraudulent scheme. So there is book number five. Book number six. We have... Paradise Bay by James Michael Pratt. This is what the book looks like. It's got a little marking right there. It looks like it's in large print. This is a 2002 copyright. And yes, it's in large print. And this is what it's about. Jack Santos grew up thinking his father died in the Vietnam War, but after 30 years, he's stunned to learn that his dad is still alive and that he's a famous musician, Lev Levi Harper. Levi came out of a much-publicized 30-year-long 30 30 coma four years earlier. In that time, he's been reunited with the great love of his life, Jenna Bradley. But as fate would have it, Levy is now dying, and since he's back in a coma, the only way Jack can get to know him is through his journal. Soon Jack learns the hopes and dreams and secrets that brought Levy from his small hometown of Paradise Bay all the way to Vietnam and back again. In turn, Jack learns things about himself as he discovers his feelings for Levy's doctor, the smart and beautiful Lin Ann. Will love triumph over tragedy, or will the past keep Jack from discovering the music in his own heart? This is it's a good book. So that's six. Book number seven, we have Pretty Woman by Fern Michaels. That's what the book looks like. The copyright is a 2005, and this is what the book's about. Rosie Gardner and Vicki Winters were best friends, closer than sisters, partners in successful mail order company. Both women live comfortably in lush Savannah, Georgia. Svelte. The in single, Vicky only wanted the best for her friend, and she couldn't stay quiet when Rosie, overweight and unable to see her own worth, fell under the spell of Kent Bliss, a two-timing cab whose meal ticket was vulnerable. Rosie, the night before Rosie's wedding, was the last 
time, Vicky spoke to her to warn her about Ken's true nature and to quit their business before leaving for Europe. Now on her third wedding anniversary, Rosie realizes Vicky was right and the Porsche and the other indulgences were her attempts to buy the love of a man who only cared about himself. Fed up with his mistreatment, she vows to change her life, starting by kicking him out that night. The next day, she begins a diet and exercise regime. But more life-changing news awaits. Rosie has a single winning ticket in a Wonder Ball lottery, and she's won $302 million. With Ken lurking in the shadows to clean the share of her money, Rosie needs her friends more than ever. And when Vicky returns to Savannah, Rosie learns the power of forgiveness as she loses weight and works out under the weight of sexy personal trainer Jack Silver. A new Rosie emerges. This woman is making a fresh start and no one's greed or bitterness or even her own occasional self-doubts will stop her from jumping into life and love with a passion she didn't know she possessed. So that sounds like a really interesting book. New Life Changes. So that's seven. Book at number eight is a really nice thick book. This is called The Evening News by author Haley. That's what the book looks like. It is a, a 1990 copyright. This is what it's about. This time the setting is network TV news. Haley, as always, the master storyteller, takes us inside the studios, newsrooms, backrooms, and worldwide bureaus of CBA TV, where two major news figures, Anchorman Crawford Sloan and Bigfoot correspond Harridge Partridge, compete and sometimes feud with each other. Their long-standing rival begins at Vietnam where both were ambitious TV correspondents and in love with the same woman. Attractive, strong-minded Jessica, a U.S. information officer in the end. Sloan wins Jessica and the CBA News Anchor Desk. Partridge continues onward to correspond, correspondent stardom until Sloan beset by a desert family crisis pleads for his former adversary's aid. The crisis involves drug finance terrorism imported to America from Peru, and both men are ca catapulted suddenly from their role as reporters in to action on the world stage. At the same time, they must deal with tensions created by the acquisition of CBA network conglomerate giant Globanic Industries. Globanic's ruthless, iron-handed president, Margaret Lloyd Mason, has a dominant concern to improve the financial bottom line no matter what the human cost. Eamon promises to keep CBA News independent and respect television's public obligation. She, in fact, does neither. The foreign leader code name, Miguel, has its own agenda for CBA, which includes a plan of dominant the airwaves and the extremist revolutionary cause. A compelling cast of characters in the maelstrom of authentic action in the TV news business moves swiftly from the glass towers of Manhattan through Canada, Italy, Colombia, Britain, France, Vietnam, Panama to final climactic scenes amid the Andes of Peru. So that sounds like a very interesting book. Book number nine, we have The Secret Hour by Louie Rice. This is what the book looks like. It has some markings there. It looks like a little tape there. And then this is a 2003 copyright. And this is what the book is about. Beneath the careful and controlled demeanor, attorney John O'Rourke is a man whose life is in turmoil. Since the death of his wife, he's been juggling the rigors of controversial capital murder case and the demands of two, raising two children. 11-year-old Maggie's crooked bangs and rumpled clothes eloquently reproach John's earnest but haphazard attempts at mothering. Teddy, John Stewart's 14-year-old, has quietly assumed responsibilities far too weighty for his young shoulders as he longs for the ways for the way things used to be, and tries to ignore the hostility that has swirled around his family since his father took on the defense of a killer whose crimes have rocked Connecticut. A brick 
through the window one autumn morning signals a dangerous new level of hatred, but a quieter event also takes place that day. A woman arrives on the O'Rourke doorstep to find a household on the brink of chaos, but brimming with love, and she hopes answers. Kate Harris is searching for the key to her own mystery. Since months, six months ago, her younger sister fled from their beloved home following a devastating confrontation after mailing a single postcard from the New England shore. Willa Harris vanished with only a postmark to go on. Kate takes leave of absence from her job as a marine biologist to come to the seaside Willa adored and discovers the one man who may be able to help her. Compelling and evocative, at once suspenseful and heartbreaking and triumphant, The Secret Hour is an unforgettable novel that explores the power of sisterly love, the gift of second chances, and the magic can sometimes be the most real thing in the whole world. So there you go. Book number nine. Book number ten, we have... Um, Home Front, a novel by Patty Davis with Maureen Strange Foster. This is what the book looks like. It is a 1986 copyright, and this is what it's about. The heroine of Home Front, Beth Canfield, is a typically American young woman who wants to love her parents, learn to love a man, and build a life for herself in peace and privacy without political interference. But politics was her father's life. At dinner time when Beth was a little girl and her father would ask her opinion of something political, she would avoid the issue by dramatically falling off her chair. But once Robert Canfield is elected governor of California, there's no more falling off her chair for Beth as she comes of age aimed at the atonement of Vietnam era. Pol- politics begins to divide her from her denial, but ideological father and from her mother Harriet Canfield a strong-willed woman fiercely loyal to her husband's dream the presidency Beth becomes not only an estranged daughter but a political liability Beth also finds herself falling in love with her friend Greg who joins the Marines gung-ho for combat in Vietnam he brings the growing conflict over the war directly into Beth's bedroom soon the pressure on Beth becomes almost intolerable, pressure that could ruin her future, her love for Greg, and her father's run for the presidency. When Greg returns, war turned from Vietnam, Beth must confront the choices of a lifetime between her famous parents and her fragile selfhood and between who she is and who she needs to be. And she actually is the daughter of Ronald and Nancy Reagan. She grew up in Northwestern University and now lives in Southern California where she works as a stage and television actress. She is writing a novel. How nice. Okay, so that is book number 10. So everything will be listed in the description below. And with that, whatever time zone you're in, I hope you're having a great one. I'll see you soon. Bye.